All right, today we have another episode from the archives with one of my incredible guests. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson, and uh, today very excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Dr. van der Kolk, welcome. Welcome. Hi. All right. Dr. Van der Kolk is a clinician, researcher, and teacher in the area of post-traumatic stress. His work integrates developmental, neurobiological, psychodynamic, and interpersonal aspects of the impact of trauma and its treatment. Dr. Van der Kolk and his various collaborators have published extensively on the impact of trauma on development, such as dissociation, uh, borderline personality, and self-mutilation. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific articles on such diverse topics as neuroimaging, self-injury, memory, neurofeedback. Dr. Van Kalk is also the founder and medical director of the Trauma Center, past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, and professor of psychiatry at Boston University Medical School. Uh, Dr. Van Kalk, um, again, thank you so much for taking the time to come on here. Good to be here. All right. So, uh, you know, before we were recording, I kind of uh, set the stage a little bit. Um, uh, I read your book. It was amazing. I'm not just saying that. Um, one of the things that uh, really struck me, and I, I guess I would uh, kind of set, set the stage by, by talking about this. There was a there was a part in the book where you and correct me if I'm wrong here you were you were early on in your career and you were in a a group and I think it was of women and one woman in particular was sharing her experience with you and I, 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 you kind of jumped in there I think like uh, maybe a lot of new clinicians think they're doing or hope they're doing. And I think you tried to, you were trying to appease her or kind of mitigate. Mm. Talk a little bit about that. And talking about when I try to help people to, that they shouldn't feel what they were feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, we're not to blame. Right. You should blame yourself. Yeah. Um, and she says, well, you know, you keep saying these things to make yourself feel better. But it's obviously that you have no understanding how to actually make me feel better. You try, try to cover up by telling me I shouldn't feel that way, that I'm not to blame. Huh? And, and yeah, I give this example very much as an example how cognition cannot get you there. Mm -hmm. And so at the core of psychology, you know, even the, the people who now hate Freud, they still believe basic, basic notion of Freud is that if you can talk about it, everything will go away. And that is a mixed thing. On the one hand, it's important to know that being able to say what happened is important to own the experience. And so much of trauma has to do with keeping secrets from yourself and people around you. So being able to tell the truth and finding words for your internal truth is terribly important in order to have ownership of your life. On the other hand, knowing where things come from and understanding why you feel so horrible does not make feeling horrible go away. Mm -hmm. So what I think a lot of psychology traditionally makes a mistake by that by understanding something, uh, you change the problem. But understanding just helps you to understand why you screwed up, which is not bad. Right. <laughs> you know. But then you need to go, okay, but how do I reorganize my survival brain to feel safe and not to feel helpless? And so what has really emerged more and more, you know, when I started to write, I wrote this article, The Body Keeps a Score, 
1994. And one of my patients had told me, my body keeps score. And I just I thought that, yeah, that, that nails it. And so 10 years after I wrote this article, not 20 years after I wrote this article, uh, I wrote my book called The Body Keeps Score. And every month I become more aware that the body keeps a score. Mm-hmm. When I first wrote a paper, it was a neurobiology paper, and the body people were so sort of curious that this Harvard guy uh, was talking about the body, so they came to listen to me. And then after hearing me talk, they said, uh, actually, you talk about the body, but I don't think you have a clue about how to work with the body. Would you like to learn? Mm-hmm. Good, arrogant person. I initially said, "Why would I want to learn from the likes of you?" And so, very gradually, they were very gentle with me. And then, people like Pete Levine and El Paso and and Pat Ogden took me under their wings and taught me something about the body. Mm-hmm. And it sits in the body. It sits in that your whole system, your organism, is rewired to feel threat everywhere. And it's on a very primitive, elemental survival part of your being. Was that, what was that like for you kind of making that shift in learning about the body and being able to utilize that when you were working with your clients? Um, Well, I think I'm still not as good as it, as it, as like my wife is a is a real body therapist, mm-hmm. and uh, she gets to really touch people and have people feel very visceral experiences. I'm still constrained by being a psychotherapist by not touching people. I think oftentimes she does better work than I do. Well, so, so are you saying I should be interviewing her? <laughs> oh yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. I can write, um, as you can also, but, um, but most people who are very good in terms of just getting attuned to the body, working with the body, and reading people's bodies with their hands, are barely also very good writers, because there's mm-hmm. a different intelligence, of course. Mm-hmm. And so the yakers yak, and the touchers touch. So if, if we go back to that uh, scene in the book where you're talking about that, that group there, how did that unfold for you as a clinician? What, where did you go? What did that? Ha- What's happened in that group is actually interesting. And that is that, uh, you know, there's a group of incest survivors. And I really believe that if you come from secret, secrecy and shame, being able to share your story and your reality and your internal world with other people who resonate with you and say, yes, I know, but it's like I thought I was the only person in the world who felt that way, but it's good to meet other people like you, was a very important thing. But I went to this group for 17 years. And after about 10 years, I thought, this group is not moving. Mm. And they continue to not have a life. And I saw their bodies, but I learned something about body therapy. And they continue to be in in a collapsed state. At that time, I did not know how to translate it into action. And after 70 years, I said to the group, you know, guys, I need to stop this group because I'm stuck. And I think I'm stuck because I don't know about the body. And I wish one of you or all of you would have realized that that you're also stuck and that you had started to talk about what else you can do to really move on with your life. But... Because you trust me so much, you haven't done that. And so I need to tell you, I'm going to go and learn how to work with the body because this is what's keeping us, keeping you from being able to move on. And so my opening into that, I got into theater. And I think theater is a very powerful way of helping people to inhabit different bodies. So one program I love to talk about is a program involved within Western Mass called Shakespeare in the Courts. That if you're a juvenile delinquent in Berkshire County, you may get condemned after stealing a car and breaking into a home to become a Shakespearean actor. A mm. terrible experience. And here you have these 
collapsed, frightened, angry kids who have never spoken very many words besides shit and fuck, who need to utter a whole Shakespearean sentence and say something like, if he had not so resembled my father, I would have done the deed myself. <laughs> and to really feel that sentence and to and have the director say, who is your father? Does your father love you? Um, does your father know you? Do you know who your father is? Would you like to do the deed yourself with your dad? Have you ever thought about killing him? And to really embody language. And so I learned it from Kevin Coleman and the, and the Shakespeare people, how to really help people to embody things. And then the latest thing I do in that regard is I run psychodramatic structures that I learned from Albert Pesso, where people actually physically have experiences that they did not have at a particular time in their lives. And where people, the situation regressed enough so that in these psychodramatic structures, you live out pieces of your past in three-dimensional structures, and then you rearrange things and people can say, oh my God, if somebody would have helped me or mm -hmm. protected me back then like this, and, and the action is happening at this point, they go like, Oh, my whole life would have been completely different. Is, is that like psychodrama, basically? It's, I mean, it's a particular form of psychodrama, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, you know, I was watching a, uh, a video uh, that you did, I think it was in Los Angeles, you were speaking to a group there, and uh, the person who was introducing you was referring to another talk you did, in which, which was in front of a bunch of therapists, apparently. And I think your opening remark was something to the effect of, uh, basically, your licenses are, I don't know what you said, but it was like a... a no, I always say, we get the license to malpractice. Right, right. So, so yeah, yeah. what, okay, talk about that. What, what's behind that? Um, well, what's behind it is that, you know, there's a real, very big difference between being an academic and being in the trenches. And since I've always had one foot in academia and one foot in the trenches, I am very aware that these are two different things. And so when you do research, which I do, you deal with a very narrow population, very narrow parameters, and you try to understand one small aspect of something. When you sit in the trenches, uh, you see people who, people who smoke dope every day and who got drunk last night and got into a car accident. All these people will be excluded from academic studies. So the academicians make up models of the world that they then get the post on the clinicians, and the clinicians say, oh, well, these smart people at some famous institution made it, let's do it. But the people who they were treating were nothing like the people you see in reality. And so people learn things like CBT in, uh, in the graduate school. And you know, CBT works very well for, uh, actually it doesn't work very well because you know, I've tried CBT on my wife many times. Really pointed out the error of her ways and to have her understand her uh, misperceptions and how she really should uh, perceive the world more accurately. And whenever I do that, she says, oh, thank you so much, you know, and really very grateful for your help. Pointing out how my reality is <laughs> My teeth is good, same, same thing. They really, really just eat it up when I correct their misunderstanding of the world. Like, how low has psychology sunk that people believe that confronting people with their irrational beliefs is makes any sense? Are these people who have ever been in a relationship with anybody? Like, <laughs> it's like, it's so weird. <laughs> and, you know, and so, uh, the things that are being taught to people are, like, you know, I see it all the time. We get um, students applying to our fellowship program. And I say, so what did you learn uh, in your internship? And I say, oh, I learned CBT. How do you like it? And they say, oh, I love it. It's really great. And it's just really love studying it. So, good. so can you give me some example of people you have worked with where CBT really worked very well? And they say, Oh, you know, but these patients, they're awful patients. You know, you do one session with them and they don't come back. So, you know, I'm just looking for better patients to give my CBT to. Uh, I think the world is very much like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
notions about how it should be, people should be. And you have people work in the trenches who see the reality, but, be, but working in the trenches is such a low prestige job that people rarely ask people who really work with really disturbed people, can you tell me how to treat people like that? People go to somebody who is in a fancy department somewhere uh, who never sees these patients themselves for expertise. Huh? So there's this gigantic disconnect between research and practice. That's what I've tried to do with my career and with my center is to always marry the research to the, to the actual clinical practice. Right, right. What is it that you feel, I mean, w- with that, uh, that you just said as kind of a backdrop here, what is it that uh, clinicians in general New, newer clinicians who are 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 missing um, that that marrying of course, but what what does that mean? What does that look like as far as you're concerned? You know, I don't think there's anything missing with the clinicians. I find them hardworking, dedicated, and slightly too trusting of authority. And I know when you go to school, I did it myself. And you have these teachers who you admire, who you want to be like, and so you try to emulate them. And then you're out of school for 10 years, and it isn't working. And for a while, you blame yourself for, oh, it's working because I'm not good enough, or I didn't listen carefully, or I didn't study hard enough. And then if you continue to really observe, you say, actually, it isn't working, not because I'm, I'm doing something wrong, but because the method doesn't work. And that's but I was very fortunate in my own training, I write about it in the book, is that in the first year of our training, this was the most prestigious Harvard program at the time, uh, our teacher said, you're not, I don't want you to read any books in your first year. You have only one teacher, and that's your patience. And I want you to spend numerous, numerous hours with very, very disturbed people and just try to figure out what's going on with them and don't read any books, but because if book, if you read books, it will get in the way of your accurately observing what's going on. I thought it was the best damn training I could have ever have had. Mm-hmm. And that the patient trumps the textbook. Is, is that, are you seeing that now in education? Is that being taught now or? Oh, no, oh, no, I think less so. Yeah. So I think um, it's more and more protocol driven and uh, prescription driven. It's prescriptive rather than learning from. Yeah. And so the people who learn from are oftentimes the people who don't have a lot of formal education like actors and yoga teachers and uh, regular teachers who just are not contaminated by these protocols of how you mm-hmm. shoot things. Yeah. Now, a kind of follow-up question here is, how, how does that type of learning then, right? If, we, if you're talking about rather than learning from books initially and uh, you know taking everything in from your, your clients, your patients, what is that demand then of you, of the clinician? Tolerance of feeling lost at sea and terrified, <laughs> which this work is anyway. Uh, tolerance of getting in touch with your own mirror neuron system and how your own feelings get reflected in somebody else. And really, so what we had in our training was very good supervision. And so what did it, what was it like for you? When this person was screaming at you, what did you do? Oh, I screamed back. Okay, that's the normal response to scream back. Uh, what can we do next time is to just sit back and observe how somebody is screaming at you. And to really notice how you feel versus how the other person feels. So that your mirror neural system does get hijacked by that other person and you try to actually affect their mirror neural system by your becoming very quiet and still and peaceful. See if you can exercise your energetic power to help that very enraged person to calm themselves down rather than mirroring them. Mm-hmm. So was- Learn how to really uh, be in relation and to use the energy between human beings 
to get people into a path of stillness and quiet is very important. We don't do that in school. Was that what was that process like for you? Kind of when you realized, you know what, I, I'm not going to be able to read a book, or I shouldn't read a book, but instead sit there with these people, with these patients. What was that like for you? I'm a generically disobedient person, so I kept reading book, reading books anyway. Of course, I all this under the under the covers <laughs> of that. <laughs> but um, but no, I think the process of uh, of fully embracing your ignorance is is fantastic actually and i liked it and i've always liked it i mean this field of traumatic stress didn't exist when i first started it and you have people who dissociate and people who have different personalities and you go like what the hell is going on here and so really continuously observe variations uh is terribly important and you know, part of the virtue of having our center is we we uh, show our videotapes to each other. Mm-hmm. And we know that our diagnostic manual is just a useless bunch of nonsense, basically. <laughs> it doesn't have any scientific validity whatsoever. And, but we get we very carefully look, oh, this person cannot hear, or this person cannot engage, or this person cannot really make use of information, or this person keeps getting stuck in the same thing over again. So we're very much into observing subtle issues, which I very much learned from the body workers also. And I'm also very involved in neuroscience. And I know, and I'm very involved in neuroscience of perception and how people take in new information. And one of the striking things about working with trauma test people is that they have a hard time learning. <laughs> because the, the mechanism of their brain to take in new information gets quite impaired. So a very big part of my work is how do you change the brain so that people can learn new things, actually? One of the things that has um, really struck me about my experience here doing this podcast is uh, one of the questions I ask is, uh, you know, to share an early error, an early mistake, and, and what uh, the, the guests has learned from that. And inevitably, Dr. Van der Kolk, it, it has come down to my guests talking about not so much about an intervention that they messed up or, you know, that they misread something on page 32 of this, this book, but of them not trusting themselves or of them, um, uh, interfering with the relationship or, or, or not being courageous enough to take that step. Um, talk a little bit about, talk a little bit more about that. Why is it, why is that challenging? Or do you think it is challenging? Uh, Actually, I would say that the greatest mistakes are with um, are with not tolerating your ignorance. For me, and so when people do something you don't understand, you try. I, I and I'm sure many of my colleagues uh, try to make them do things to make us feel less stupid or ineffectual. And of course, the more experience you get, you actually get to know a few things, so you can allow yourself to be more ignorant. So my great teacher I talk about in the book was always ignorant. Mm. And he modeled his ignorance to us uh, because he was conf- confident. Of course, when you're a young person, you're both ignorant and and at loss, and then you tend to sort of push people into doing things. but uh, the hard, I think the mistakes that I make and many people I work with is to try to control people's behavior so that you don't feel so helpless. And That's a big, it's not a big issue for me anymore. <laughs> it's, it's not, you said it's not a big issue anymore? Okay. It's not a big issue for you as much? No, no, I, I think I can, I can really, like my old teacher now, really scratch my head and say, Huh, you said that, you said that. I mean, you know, I've always admired Colombo, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and my, my, he, he, actually, like, I think uh, good therapist is like Colombo, yeah. <laughs> if, if you had, and, 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 and you, probably ha- you probably have this uh, at, the, at the trauma center there, but if you had, a small group of people sitting in front of you, students 
who were wanted to, you know, get into this field, what, what would you advise them? What would you say to them? Let's say, bring in your videotapes. Bring in your videotapes. Yeah. Let's watch videotapes. Let's look at the process, what happens here. Uh, what do you think would have happened if you had kept your mouth shut at this point? What would somebody else have said at this particular point? Would you have moved your body forward? Would you have changed your tone of voice? Would you have sat back and breathed a little bit different? So I think God is reading the details, and yakking never gives you the details. I think you need to have the multimedia exposure. Mm. Because you need to see the process, and you need to hear people's change of voice, uh, people's change in posture, you need to see how the body uh, follows the words, basically. It's very much about following the body. In terms of, uh, you know, you talked about tolerating your own ignorance. Um, why is that challenging for, for a lot of us? Well, because we think ignorance is the same as stupidity. <laughs> but it isn't. Ignorance is the opening to learning. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, I'm not blaming our school system necessarily because it's pretty universal. But, uh, yeah, actually, but some school systems are much better in in helping people to use their ignorance to create new things, of course. Again, in education, it's also just like in psychology, more and more prescriptive, more and more tests. Have you learned that? And very little emphasis of, wow, aren't you surprised about, or aren't you interested that you didn't understand this? Mm-hmm. I still don't know why the sky is blue. I know there's an answer for it somewhere, but if you, I can't give it to you. <laughs> why, why do you think, not, not so much why you got into this field, but w- what makes you as effective as you are doing this work? Well, you know, it's always a question whether you're effective. Uh, but uh, I think the, the root of effectiveness is the to your own self be true, huh? To really, to really trust that you see, and to uh, and to love to follow your follow your news. Huh? To actually, that if you like to work with the body. Go work in the body. If you hate to work in the body, don't do it. Do something mm-hmm. else. But so, again, something that our culture isn't very good at, but you need to really uh, follow the things that are rewarding to you. Uh, uh, that you really can wake up in the morning, be enthusiastic about, to look forward to continue to work with people. So, if you are puzzled and amazed how some people talk ragtime and what happens in their brain that ragtime comes out, go and become a schizophrenia person. You can you go like, wow, where did this, did this come from? If you hate people being illogical, don't work with schizophrenics. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so really, I, what I'm hearing you say is kind of really honoring your gut, in a sense, where that's taking you. Yeah. Whatever you do needs to match with a core inner curiosity and, and sense of satisfaction. Yeah. So you're saying that you, this you have a great you've always had a great satisfaction about individuals who've been yeah I've, impacted. I've always, I've always really enjoyed what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that curiosity has really come come been in your favor worked in your favor. Yeah, and also I get punished on a regular basis. Also, <laughs> punished by your by your patients? No, no, no. Uh, um, so when I started the trauma center, for example, uh, a person on my floor, who's now a famous psychiatrist, said, "Bessel, you are so obsessed with this trauma stuff. When you croak, nobody will ever talk about trauma anymore." And I said, "Oh, I hope so." Um, and then. Um, 
my clinic gets closed at that hospital because we are the boutique. We are this esoteric little group of people who talk about something as strange as childhood trauma. And then our clinic gets closed somewhere else because uh, we're supposed to do drug trials and because it makes money for the department and we don't bring enough money. Uh, so, you know, there's a reason why people are not true to themselves because if you treat to yourself, uh, you may be all by yourself at some point. <laughs> yeah. You wrote the book, um, The Body Keeps Score, and again, we're going to have all this uh, linked up at the show notes page at the com. What, what was... Uh, your main impetus for writing this book, would you say? Uh, Many uh, impetuses, I think. Uh, One of which is that I interviewed, I interview residency applicants every year and uh, for many, many years. And I always ask people, what book have you read that inspired you to to want to become a psychiatrist or a psychologist? And for the last 10 years, 12 years, None of them has given me the name of a book that they said, that book just got me to do it. Mm. I thought that was just astounding because when I grew up, um, I read all the time. And if you would tell me what books inspired you as an 18, 19, 20 year old to do what you did, I can give you the names. I never promised you Rose Garden, Man's Search for Meaning, Eric Fromm, Escape from Freedom. Those were the books, um, uh, uh, Paul Marcuse. Um, these were the books like, yeah, boy, I want to do this for a living. I want to devote my life to this. So most of all, I wanted to write a book that if a young person would read it, like, because psychiatry has become such a desiccated, uh, soulless profession. I don't see how anybody ever wants to be psychiatrist anymore, giving pills to people. Uh, uh, it's pretty sad. Profession, and I wanted young people to read this book and go like, this is the most interesting in the world. I am going to devote my life to exploring how the mind works and how we can help people to, to lead good lives. Yeah. So you, as, a book, as it has turned out, I think it has mainly been, uh, the main impact has been of a lot of survivors reading the book mm-hmm. and say, that is me. Finally, somebody gets it and gives me some pathway out of the misery that I'm experiencing. Well, it's pretty powerful to, to to have have done that. Pretty lucky to have done it. You know, I feel very fortunate, actually. Like, you know, when you write a book, you never know how soon it will be on the remainder table, you know? Right, uh, right. And I've been just delighted and felt ble- blessed by how many people are reading it and how many people like it. So. From, from my perspective you seem to straddle different uh, kind of segments, uh, you know, academia, uh, practicing and so forth. And uh, with a, with a, a a large kind of overlay of irreverence that. Yeah, but also reverence. (laughs) Also reverence, but, but, but yeah, but it seems to really inspire, I think a lot of people and and it, it definitely inspires me. Um, how, how do you do that? How does that work for you? Um, you know, character is destiny. You know, um, I'm a multilingual person. I'm a Dutch person. I come from a very small country originally where if you travel 50 miles to the south, you speak a different language and 50 miles to the east, you speak a different language. And so I grew up in a multicultural culture and, um, in intellectually, I've always been multicultural. I've always always loved poetry and art, and I've always loved science. And so, uh, that's my character. You know, uh, I studied classical Greek, but I was not a great classical Greek student because I was spending too much time also studying in physics. And so today also. I'm trying to be a serious neuroscientist, but I love clinical work and I love psychodrama and all this sort of stuff. And if I would leave out any of these pieces, I would feel that I was not true to myself. That's me. I cannot expect other people to also have a 
a real passion for science and a passion for for the intricacies of, of therapy, which is not science. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's, uh, as we as we kind of close out here, uh, I want to put that question to you in terms of a uh, a book that has inspired you recently that you would like to kind of suggest to our listeners, whether trauma related or not. What would you uh, What would you say? Trauma related books. My latest book that's exciting for me is a book called Silk Roads. It's the history of the world in terms of how peoples have always traded goods and stuff with each other and all the wars and misery and religions, tensions that occurred in, in the context of it. I just, I adore that book. It's just amazing. And I learned, I've read history all my life and uh, almost in every page I found it, other piece of information that I didn't know before. Um, but that, that's not that all about trauma because people do to gain dominance, of course, cause a lot of trauma, but it really has nothing to do with clinical work. I don't read many clinical books. I read a lot of scientific literature. I, I peer review a lot of things. If you want me to talk about the, the latest peer reviewed article that I reviewed that I'm excited about, I'd love to tell you about it because we are learning stuff about brain circuits and how brain circuits have to do with your insula and the degree to which your insula, naming your connection between your brain and your body, registers something as being relevant. And it has something to do with the cerebellum and how the cerebellum organizes you to become focused on particular subjects. And if the work of my colleagues, uh, this is Ruth Lanius's lab, is anything to go by, this is going to be the main theme of my annual conference this year. Uh, at some point, if people actually get to integrate and take in this very complex information, that treatment has more to do with the action that you take and the actions that you get taught than actually how you talk about it. Uh, so uh, I've always been a fan of martial arts, and that indeed that things like martial arts and making music can really organize the way that your brain engages with the world. Mm-hmm. And I think... To my mind, that's where we as a profession needs to go to, is to find ways in which uh, we can help people to pay attention differently, to focus differently, to help people to figure out, not figure out, but to organize what is relevant and what's irrelevant. And all these systems in our patients are very disturbed. All kind of irrelevant information starts running the show, uh, it's hard for them to focus. It's hard for them to switch sets when something isn't working into something else. And these are all mind-brain capacities that have almost nothing to do with understanding. It has something to do with really organizes the way that the human organizes and engages with things. And that's the frontier of our field as far as I'm concerned. So with the understanding that uh, this is one of the newer articles, do do you want to share the name of that, or can can would you be willing to? It's okay. Okay. Uh, but 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 the uh, the the issues here are is the understanding about the mind and brain as networks, and it has to do with the salience network of the brain. Uh, what does your mind automatically find relevant in terms of paying attention to? And the exec the executive function of your brain of how do you organize yourself to com- accomplish a task? And the default state of your brain, what are you like when you're not engaged with anything at all and you're just with yourself? And it's these networks that need to be organized. And I think our job as clinicians is to figure out how to best organize and reorganize these networks. And so part of what I'm doing is I'm doing neuro- neurofeedback research, applied neuroscience to see how by playing computer games with, with your own brainwaves, you can reorganize those brainwaves so that your mind engages with the world in a different way. Wow, exciting. Clinically, yeah. um, uh, 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 in addition to uh, the video games, what else have you... Well, that's what not else? Video, actually, it's, a, it's feedback. In the same way that when I say something you like, you have a little crinkles like your eyes and when you're bored... 
you see those trophy in your face, you give me feedback all the time. Huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you change my brain as we're talking to each other. And so you can amplify those feedback systems by with computer games that really, uh, picking up what happens in your brain and then helps you to make more of one thing and less of another thing, basically. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, if people want to uh, reach out to you and find out where you're going to be next, what talk you're going to be giving to next, what's the best way for people to... Uh, my website, bestofvandercock.net. Okay. okay. All right. We'll have that linked up at the show notes page. Uh, Dr. Vandercock, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, we'll be in touch. Okay. Be good. Bye-bye.